Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg UK, a special focus on the biggest challenges facing the British government, the economy, financial services and markets. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, it's a big week for central banks, not least of which the Bank of England. Traders now piling into bets on BOE rate cuts next year, pricing in five cuts of 25 basis points next year. Now, it follows signaling of possible U.S. rate cuts next year by the Federal Reserve. That's despite U.K. inflation remaining sticky compared to the EU and the US and some UK economists saying that the BOE may use this week's rate decision to warn that borrowing costs must remain elevated well into 2024. Now the former BOE Monetary Policy Committee member Michael Saunders has told Bloomberg that the bank could keep the possibility of further interest rate hikes in their language and warns that the UK is really stuck in a slow growth rut. Lower potential growth has weighed on the UK economy significantly over the last few years. Look, real GDP per head on the IMS figures for this year will still be below the 2019 level. And the UK over that period has been the worst performer among the G7 countries. And it's, not, it's not likely to get any better in the coming years. I have to say, low potential growth doesn't really um, make the UK more inflation prone because it also bears down on the pace of demand. So low potential growth is neutral in terms of the output gap, which is what matters for the inflation prospect. But it means that the UK is just sort of stuck in a low growth rut. As for the fiscal arithmetic, look, there are quite a lot of moving parts. Lower bond yields since the autumn statements will help the fiscal arithmetic. If the OBR project lower migration, that would harm it. And there may be other moving parts between now and the budget. I think it's too early at this stage to have an assessment of whether the fiscal position will look better or worse. But the fiscal space, in any case, is very limited. And the government's fiscal plans at the moment rest on large, unspecified and frankly implausible cuts in real public spending over the next few years. So we'll have, of course, uh, plenty more on what the BOE will or won't do. A lot will uh, depend, of course, on, on market bets and whether uh, the governor uh, thinks that he needs to really push back against us. Now, this is the picture overall for markets. If you look at some of um, the, the, well, the record highs we've seen on the CAC 40 and, of course, elsewhere in the DAX. It hasn't quite filtered through to the UK, but it's very clear that stocks and bonds are rallying as traders are betting on rate cuts from uh, the Fed. You can see sterling 126.57, uh, the 10-year yield 3.676. This is a picture across the board. Now, let's also look at what other things are doing. Now, the traders are, of course, betting on rate cuts, and that's changing everything. If you look on the risk on a rush following some of the dovish signs yesterday from the Fed, which held rates steady and forecast that their next move could be lower. I'm looking at the dot plot. We don't always look at the dot plot. We should probably look at the dot plot a little bit more, showing that 75 basis points of reductions in 2024 are sharper pace of easing than indicated in September. So let's discuss the UK outlook with economist Martin Wheel, who's also a former member, of course, of the BOE's Monetary Policy Committee. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Martin, give me a sense, first of all, on whether Andrew Bailey's job and the MPC's job has been complicated by what we heard from the Fed yesterday. Well, the Fed does exert quite a gravitational force on interest rates throughout the world. Uh, my guess is that the Bank of England will want to be rather cautious about suggestions that rates might be cut substantially next year. We have wage growth at 7.3%. We have core inflation of 5.7. We have services inflation of 6.6%. And, of course, what uh, we actually need is inflation of 2%. So there is still a long way to go. But uh, if the Fed is cutting rates, then, as I say, that does exert a gravitational pull that perhaps the Bank of England would rather be without. Okay, so traders are now betting on five BOE 25 basis point rate cuts in 2024. I mean, is that excessive? Well, I don't know what's going to happen, what the future is going to bring, but it seems to me making quite strong assumptions about how the remaining inflation is going to be squeezed out of the system. 
Martin, give me a sense of how do, do you think a hawkish hold will actually be communicated? I know if you look at BOE members, uh, they have been split in the past. We're probably expecting them to, to remain split right now. But what does the messaging need to be in terms of also, you know, financial conditions being tightening that would help the BOE going forward? Well, I think what the Bank of England needs to say is that it wants to see inflation fall sustainably to 2%, not simply benefit from the effects of unwinding the sharp increases in fuel and energy prices that we saw last year. And, uh, of course, those two are very different things. As Charles Goodhart was saying in the Financial Times this morning, there are reasons for thinking that maybe inflation will start to pick up again towards the end of next year. If, and that, of course, will be all the more likely with financial conditions easing as they are now. Do you think the Bank of England has done hiking? Well, it's very hard to say. I think probably they are at the top, but uh, it does remain to be seen how far and how fast these indicators of underlying inflation do come down. And we don't actually know that. I mean, what we can say is that wage growth in Britain is perhaps higher than in the United States, and that cre it's obviously a good thing for people who are getting wage increases, but it does create more of an right. inflationary problem. And you're absolutely right. We, we don't know, but you're a great student of the UK economy. You've had to vote, of course, on, M on MPC decisions in the past. How tricky is it right now for Governor Bailey to get it right? Well... It's always tricky to get it right. I think the problem he has is that if headline inflation falls to close to 2%, which it may do, there will be a lot of political pressure on him to, to encourage the MPC to cut rates. Remember, it's the MPC's decision, not uh, Andrew Bailey's decision alone. So there will be a lot of pressure on him. And... Uh, he will have to be, or the committee will have to be very aware of the indicators of underlying inflation, looking at what's happening in the labour market and not simply being influenced by the headline figure. Yes, and, and you know, we have a, a great, actually, Bloomberg story looking at the BOE's most hawkish member, Catherine Mann, an external member who also described herself possibly as being on the hawkish side of things. And then we have a great profile also on Jonathan Haskell, external member as well, um, saying that there's probably no prospect of early interest rate cuts. So it probably gives you the two you know, barometers, the two side of things. But, Martin, if you were to, to vote, what kind of rate path do you see over the next six to eight months. Are you more worried about the low level of productivity or do you want to make sure that actually we don't see a recession? Well, what I'm worried about is making sure that inflation is sustainably squeezed out of the economy. That's the primary job of the MPC. And I've always saw, I always saw that as the main influence on my voting decision. You know, things were simpler while I was a member than they are now. Uh, subject to that, of course, the MPC has the obligation to support the government's aims for the economy, which I've always taken, or aims for growth and employment, which I've always taken to mean support employment and uh, support growth. But that is only subject to delivering on the inflation target. So I would be very much bearing in mind the, prim the primacy of the inflation target. Uh, Dave Ramsden, the deputy governor for markets and banking, uh, says he's worried that inflation is more homegrown. Would you agree with that? Well, I think if you look at what's been happening to wage growth and you look at what's been happening to services inflation, then you can say that there is a lot of homegrown inflation now. And so what does that mean in terms of decision making? If you, again, th th we, we've had these GDP figures, Martin, that weren't great for the UK. So are we now faced with a stagnant economy and it, it does whatever the BOE do, can, can it actually tip it one way or the other? Well, the Bank of England or the MPC does have an influence on the growth rate of the economy. But uh, could I repeat that their primary function is to deliver 2% inflation? And they've always argued that uh, delivering low inflation was the biggest contribution the committee could make to sustained economic growth. And I think that's still true. But given all of the, I guess, nuances, do you think a 5.25 key rate interest rate it, you know, make sure that inflation continues to fall downwards? 
I think it probably does. I think uh, no, we are now in a situation where there are downward pressures not only on headline inflation but also on services inflation and wage inflation. So I think sustaining the rate where it is now probably will bring those back towards target, of course, though one or to back to a point consistent with the target. Of course, once you get there, then of course then there's the question know how rap or rather on the path there there's the question how rapidly do you need to cut rates so as to minimize the impact on output and that's always a difficult question Martin how are you expecting actually the labor market that has so far been tight and so has held up quite strong how do you expect that to behave in 2024 well I think if rates you know, don't fall as rapidly as indicated if financial conditions don't loosen as much as markets though, seem to be imposing at the moment, then I expect that uh, the labour market will continue to ease. Of course, we do have these problems with the, with the data, but uh, if we look at what's happening to wage growth, that has turned down now, and that is good news. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. Martin Wielder, a former member of the BOE's Monterey Policy Committee. We'll have, of course, plenty more on the outlook for the UK shortly. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg UK. Now let's discuss the prospects of stagnation and low growth with Bloomberg Economics' Anna Andrade and John Stepek, author of Bloomberg's newsletter, Money Distilled. It's very good, so I hope you're all subscribed. And talk us through, good morning, first of all. How rude of me. Good morning. It's a big central bank day. Like, our head is spinning, and I think a lot of the central bank governors are probably just you know, re-looking at what Powell said. Um, and if, if you look at the growth prospects for this country and inflation, I mean, is it so much harder to put monetary policy for the UK just because everything seems exacerbated. It's a small open economy. Yeah, good morning. So yeah, it's definitely a challenge that central banks face because essentially if your supply is limited, you can only grow at a very, very low pace um, without generating inflation. Uh, so that's something that needs to be solved. Monetary policy doesn't really have the tools. I mean, central banks don't have the tools to solve it. So it really needs to be up to the government to kind of, you know, channel the right resources invest in invest, uh, invest well make sure that investment increases uh, and make sure that productivity gains pick up again because we had a major fall in productivity growth if you compare like the three de three years going into the global financial crisis labor productivity was averaging above two percent now it's just been stuck at 0.4 percent so kind of you know something needs to be done on that on that front yeah, I know John's going to push back against me because every time I say something <laughs> mildly, um, you know, not negative, but even Andrew Bailey, John, said, you know, the UK is facing its worst outlook in his career. Inflation more than double the inflation target, worker pay rising rapidly. You're pushing back, aren't you? Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean Andrew, this time, kind of like last year, was saying we were going to be in the, the uh, a kind of generational recession by now, um, which we're not. I mean, I think one thing you have to say is that the outlook going into 2024 is actually a lot more positive than it was this time yeah. last year. Um, which seems crazy, John, yeah. given oh, no, where interest does. rates... I mean, yeah. interest rates have gone up by so much. It's incredible that we haven't had a big event or a big credit event or, or elsewhere, right? Absolutely. And I think the one thing that most people have underestimated is how resilient the financial system is post-2008. I mean, it's sort of, it sounds mad, but actually the things that were put in place after 2008, they had a lot of bad side effects as well. They probably restricted, you know, the kind of growth to an extent. But it also had the, you know, the benefits of making the, uh, the housing market, for example, in this country much more resilient. Um, you know, lending standards were better. So as a result, the kind of national balance sheets of any country that actually suffered a big yeah. crash in 2008 are actually much more resilient than they were back then. Whereas places like Canada and Australia, which didn't have the same sort of pain in 2008, are now, you know, consumers are much more indebted than they were. Companies are generally a bit more indebted than they were. So actually, you know, we came out of OA in a bad shape, but we went into this in a much better shape than I think most people understood at the time. But, and I mean, again, to you both, but I mean, the idea that actually instead of having like an ugly recession, 
but quite quick recession, the idea that now we could look at a protracted slump, does it make it harder to balance interest rates to, to get it right? Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with John that we've had like, it has been a story of resilience. If you do put like the interest rate path that we've just had in such a short amount of period into any model, it would kind of suggest that, you know, we would be expected to have a 5% hit to GDP and we just haven't had that. Now I guess the question going forward is whether we need a downturn to bring inflation under control or not. And I mean our view is that we, you know, we do need a mild downturn in order to bring inflation under control, but it might be that we don't and the implication of that would be that supply is stronger than we expected. So actually just by holding in this kind of stagnation, you know, status like uh, the economy in itself can, you know, Push down on price pressures, but you know that's. I guess that's the question going going forward into 2024. So, Anna, when are you expecting cuts from Bank of England? And again, the markets are frankly behaving like it's a bit of a party, right? You know, sure. the Fed's going to cut, the POE is going to follow, and everything's good. But if they're cutting because we're seeing a recession, then it it complicates matters. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why we've been saying that the BOE will cut even before inflation hits 2%. It essentially kind of will cut, will, will feel comfortable cutting when inflation is kind of at 3%, which is not ideal because the hardest part was always going to bring inflation from 3% to 2%, but it will be open to do so if it sees the economy, um, you know, weakening. Um, if you look at the timing of the meetings that we're going to have and at the inflation, I mean, inflation will still be running at around 5% until January. That for me feels like too early to cut, so February is a no-go. Um, and then, you know, March, um, March and April and, and May, I also don't see them cutting just because in our forecast, inflation gets to 3% in the April CPI, but they won't, will only have that after the May meeting. So the earliest we see is actually June. That will leave the BOE a little bit later than the Fed. Yeah. Uh, but I think that's reasonable just because the inflationary episode was so much worse um, here in the UK. So it's, it's likely that the BOE would kind of be the last one to move. John, what's your take? Well, I think it's really interesting because if the market's already pricing in these rate cuts... And many of them. And many of them. I mean, you remember the, the main transmission mechanism to the consumer in the UK is the mortgage market. The thing is, because there were so many fixed rate mortgages, the, the full hit from the 5.25% hasn't hit. But now we're cutting, and a lot of people are remortgaging in, in 2024. They're going to be remortgaging at closer to 4 4.5%, maybe sub-4% than maybe the 5 or close to 6% they were expecting. So in a funny kind of way, you're short-circuiting the transmission mechanism before it's, it's even hit. So I actually think there's a serious risk of it. It's a good risk, but there's a risk that the UK will have actually quite a much stronger economy next year, particularly the latter half of next year, because consumers aren't going to be as under the cosh as they've been this year. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's going to be a hard balancing act. But I think your point, Anna, this is not really something the central bank can fix. It's something that government needs to kind of improve the kind of, you know, the, the efficiency of the economy. Um, and of course, we've got an election coming next year, so that's not going to happen. But John, I mean, it'd actually be genius, right? If they're cushioning mortgages, they're basically setting monetary policy for mortgages, which in the UK is, is such a huge factor in the mm, economy, yeah. then actually they could be really getting it right. But I, I mean, they could be getting it right, except that if everything, you know, if we're off to the races again, then the risk, of course, is that inflation takes off again. But that is, you know, that can go either way because if people feel that energy bills aren't going up and that their mortgage bill isn't going to go up, that takes pressure off wages, you know, because people aren't going to be demanding higher wages. So, yeah, maybe we'll get a really nice soft landing and everyone will actually be okay. All right, I almost want to ask you when you think the election is because of the economy, but I want, we'll do it in January. We'll get this panel back together and we're going to take bets. And Andrade and John Stebek, thank you both for joining us. Coming up, we're talking UK politics after a pretty busy week at Westminster. This is Bloomberg. Well, it's been a tough week for the UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, defending his actions as Chancellor at the COVID inquiry and facing down rebellion over his Rwanda immigration policy. Let's get straight to our UK government reporter, Emily Ashton. Emily, as always, thank you. So it seems that uh, the Prime Minister will see out the year, but is he on borrowed time? 
Yes, I mean, we just we saw this uh, polling. He is now as unpopular as Boris Johnson was when he resigned. And that's a poll from YouGov. Not great polling for Rishi Sunak. And he's had a really difficult week. Uh, start of the COVID inquiries that brought back the chaos of 2020 and how the government handled the pandemic in those early stages. And then this big vote on Tuesday, the second reading of his legislation on Rwanda to get asylum seekers deported to Rwanda. That's a really keynote policy, and he's really basing his premiership on it. Um, and it did get through, but there were a lot of abstentions, and he lost an immigration minister on that the week before. So a very difficult week. And, and crucially, that is the first rung of a very long ladder to get that legislation through. And that is going to dominate the, the weeks and the months after Christmas, which is quite dangerous for British Sunak because really he doesn't want that to dominate just before an election, which is expected next year. Yes, yeah, so, and again, there's so much speculation about whether it's in the spring, it's in the fall, and he's looking at polling, he's looking at the economy. I mean, when can we expect the election? Well, it has to be held by the end of January 2025. But as you say, we don't exactly know um, when it could be. At the moment, the likelihood is autumn, October, November. Um, but there is some speculation about May. Now, he wants he might want to go earlier to maybe surprise Labour and to, to hold it as kind of a take-back control election, like these judges are thwarting us getting our legislation through on Miranda um, and the elites don't let us do what we want to do. And he could do a kind of big election like that. But there is a real danger in that with his ratings being so low. Um, could he really like win people over? He might want the numbers on the economy to get a bit better um, and for October, November to be a better time. But also it might be out of his hands if he if he gets a lot of rebellions on the Conservative Party side. Um, he might have to go earlier than he wanted. Thank you so much, Bloomberg's UK government reporter, Emily Ashton. Now, be sure to also subscribe to Bloomberg's In The City podcast that I host with David Merritt and Allegra Stratton on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes drop every Thursday. It's today. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.